Hi everyone, hope you are enjoying watching the moon with us on the moon challenge. As we move to the day 7, you will realize that the crescent moon is growing. It is now about 36% illuminated. It's a nice thick crescent. Well, it is still an evening object and we can still say that it is seen in the west. On this particular day, the moon appeared in an area of the sky which is often called the gateway of heaven. Of course, there is no portal to space in this area. It is just that there are a few stars which make up a shape which is often referred to as the gateway. Now, these stars include Pollux and Castor which are part of the constellation Gemini. In India, we call this area a nakshatra called Punarvasu. A nakshatra is a lunar mansion, a place where the moon is likely to appear and we'll talk about the nakshatras in a later episode. So in this area uh, you can see these two uh, can be joined by a line and almost parallel to that we find Procyon and this tiny star forming a line. Now you can just try to imagine a gateway with this as a pillar and this as a pillar and this area allowing things to pass through. Now what other things pass through this? Of course you can see the moon is going through here but then you might re realize that there's this weird orange line here. Well it happens to be the path of the sun in the sky also called the ecliptic. As the earth moves around it the sun traces out a particular path in the sky and this is the line that it seems to follow in the sky. Since all the planets lie in the same plane as the earth approximately, we would see them lying in the sky approximately close to this particular line. And as you can see this line itself passes through the gateway of heaven and therefore this is a place where you would see all the planets and the moon and the sun passing through. So therefore a nice name to give to this area. Of course it's all imaginary and we remember areas in the sky by certain asterisms like this. If you have been following the apparent path of the moon which I'm going to show you from day 3 onwards when it became visible over say the trees of horizon, it has been moving along this line almost along this line. You see the moon has moved to a slightly higher position on day 4, slightly higher, slightly higher and on day 7 it is near Pollux and Castor here between Pollux and Procyon let's say in the gateway of heaven as we happen to call it. It has moved past this star here Aldebaran and slowly past Venus and past here close to Pollux. The moon of course is not following the path of the sun because it has its plane of orbit approximately 5 degrees inclined to the plane of the sun and the earth. I have told you this before but this is an interesting way to see how we may have found out about this particular thing. So this is, uh, if you let's say I could draw an imaginary line along the path the moon has taken. Uh, here which I have just drawn some rough line here, you will see that it crosses the ecliptic and it kind of makes an angle. The maximum angle which can be made between these two lines has been found to be 5 degrees and therefore that the moon's orbital plane is inclined to the earth sun plane by about 5 degrees. You see it is not that we have to go to space to do this, we could just do this by basic observations but it would take some time we would have to do this over many months and years to find out what is the maximum position that the moon occupies away from the ecliptic while moving around in the sky. This is a good place where it has crossed the ecliptic and you could draw such a line and find this angle. A lovely exercise to do which if you wish you could take up at some point of time. Now you must be waiting for a regular feature of the detailed picture of the moon seen through a telescope. Yes, again 
Anirudh has shared this lovely set of pictures which have been stitched together to make this complete picture of the moon. You can see there are more features visible here at the edge of the shadows on the moon and some of the features that we recognized earlier have kind of faded off in a very smooth terrain. This is more because of the lighting conditions in which the shadows which give us the idea of the shape of a feature kind of wear off when direct light falls on them from the top. We of course cannot see the whole moon in detail at one time so we will go to a small area and see the details of that. As described yesterday this is the north side of the moon. For our reference we always have the Mare Crisium. We also had seen Mare Tranquillitatis. This area has a certain importance on the moon. You might also remember these terms that I had introduced you to. Mare here as in these objects is a sea. Something which looks like a sea. Apparently if you don't know there is no water on the moon in such large quantities. We have Montes, a mountain, which is actually a mountain, so it's not within quotes. Then there are two new terms for today, Pallas, which is a marsh, and Sinus, which is a bay. Basically, a large body of water, like a sea or an ocean, can seep into the land in what is called a bay. And along that bay lie some marshes, which is basically a combination of land and water. So you can see the lovely imagination of the early observers on the moon when they had named features like Palasomni and Sinus Concordiae. So you can see that the Sea of Tranquility is imagined to be a huge body of water on the moon and it kind of leaks into the land here in this bay called Concordiae. Sinus stands for bay and this bay then gives its water to this marsh which looks slightly lighter colored and it's called the Palace Somni or the Marsh of Sleep. So these are the lovely imaginary features and it's good to remember them because they can point us to various important features on the moon. We of course have Atlas and Hercules as reference from yesterday. These two, uh, these two big craters which again seem to now have faded from their glory as they appeared in earlier pictures. We have the cold sea, the Mare Frigoris, and now here we see becoming visible some of the important craters on the really north side. So this is Aristoteles, named after the Greek philosopher Aristoteles, who was a person whose teachings and ideas governed astronomy and science for a thousand years. He is a symbol of scientific thought. But he also is a reminder to us that sometimes we degrade science to thinking that it's only written in the books. Well, no, science is always looking for more and more evidence and things which elders like Aristotle say can be proved false. For example, he would have probably thought the moon was a heavenly object which was perfect sphere in the sky. However, Galileo, after using his telescope, showed that it was not so and it was a rough rocky body in space and it is uh, but an irony that Aristotle's name be given to one of the large craters on the same body. Well, his legacy was broken by Galileo and Copernicus and we now know much better about the solar system. Let's move on from this story into other features like the Mare Serena Tetis the Sea of Serenity, a part of which we could see yesterday. It is lined on this edge by two mountain ranges, the Montes Caucasus and the Montes Hamus. Now some of these mountains are visible only because their tops are catching the light of the sun. The bottoms of them may not be visible. It is possible to actually find the height of such mountains and craters by using the shadows. In fact, even Galileo had done such an exercise. So that is something, again, which you should find out and try to do. This is possible if you could get good pictures of the moon such as this. We have, of course, from the olden times, uh, a 
some names left on the moon. This is the name of Julius Caesar given to this large crater here. You know the month of July is named after Julius Caesar and he was one of the earlier rulers of the Roman Empire who started using a calendar for the people to follow which slightly differed from the months which were governed by the cycle of the moon. We will now move to the other unseen side. In this frame we have our node C's for reference and also Langrinus, the first crater that we identified on the moon. I am showing you this particular frame because it has the very important site on the moon where humans for the first time landed and it happens to be a site in the Sea of Tranquility. Well, Apollo 11 landed here in 1969 in, in an area somewhere here where Neil Armstrong became the first person to put a footstep on the moon. And in fact, if I had better resolution, there are three craters here which could have been seen which are named after the three people who went to the moon in the Apollo 11 mission. This frame also features the Apollo 17 landing site. Apollo 17 was the last manned mission to the moon and so this particular frame based around the Sea of Tranquility has both the first landing site of humankind and the last previous landing site of humankind. I hope in the near future we will be going there again with a different purpose. We are also lunar explorers this month. Let us now move further towards the south and see some of the very prominent features that have become visible here. So this frame takes us right almost up to the south pole of the moon. And to join to the previous frame we have the Mare Tranquillitatis, the Sea of Tranquility. Well, very close to the landing site of Apollo 11, we have a crater called Hypatia. It is named after the famous astronomer and mathematician Hypatia of Alexandria. Now, this is one of the rarer craters on the moon, which is named after a woman. Hypatia was a leader in her field almost 800 years back. Her writings have been followed up by greats like Newton as well in founding their further efforts in mathematics. However, you will also realize that she is one of the rarer women featured in any kind of history of science. But I think this needs to be changed and we have to take efforts in this modern age where there is equality in both education and opportunities for everyone to contribute to science. Well, the names of the features on the moon were actually decided long back before the modern times. And that's why you will see features like Stevinus or Moroleus here, which you cannot probably identify with any person that you have heard of. These were fixed when the earliest catalog of the moon came out and whoever was ruling around that time made sure that the people he knew in his times were featured as names of the most prominent features on the moon. Stevinus is a ray crater. And I have not mentioned it earlier as it was just a tiny crater. But now you can see that with a different angle of light falling, it has become a very prominent feature and in fact as important as Langrenus. So you can see how perspective can change the image of something. We will talk about ray craters later in the series as bigger and better ray craters become visible. However, Stevinus is one of the landmarks on the east side of the moon. We come to Moroleus, again named after a famous personality of those times, but for us right now this crater itself is a landmark on the southern highlands. As you can see, these areas are actually higher in height compared to the seas. These are flatlands lower in height where the lava has solidified into basaltic rock many billions of years ago. These places were highlands of higher height and they might have been flat at some point of time but as you can see this area has seen a blizzard of rocks and asteroids and whatnot falling on it 
making this one of the most pockmark riddled areas on the moon. Here we really have to go crater hopping to find objects. So I hope you remember Janssen, the large crater here. We had also mentioned Pitiscus, this small crater right after Janssen towards the south. I had mentioned Manzinus, which was the landing area where the Vikram lander was supposed to land. Well, if you approximately take the distance between Pitiscus and Manzinus and continue along this direction to an equal distance, you will probably reach the south pole of the moon. However, we are still not able to see it in this particular frame on day 7. So I'm looking forward to day 8 and the following days so that we could observe more of this very feature rich area of the moon. We will continue to request you to share your moon challenge experiences. For example, here is a picture taken by Anirudh who shared it with me. He had not just tried to see the moon in the evening but actually had spotted it right after the moon rose. Yes, the moon is not just an object visible in the west in the evening, it also rises at some point of time and it rises after sunrise. So he took up this challenge and spotted it just one and a half hours after moonrise on one of the days. So you should also feel free to send us your own images like this or some different experiences. You are welcome to tag us online with hashtag moonchallenge or you can send your pictures in with some details to scipop at gmail.com. Your inputs are always welcome and as we continue with the moon challenge, we are looking forward to your support. See you again on the next day.